most of the people in India, the high percentage of people of India still live in the villages. In the cities, the cities are growing. More and more people are coming to the cities, but still, a high percentage of India's people live in the villages and they're farmers. And most of these people are Hindus. In some villages of India, there are, of course, Muslims, but the high percentage are Hindus. And the thing that is so sad is that most of these Hindus in the villages of India have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. I did a lot of village work myself. I have been in many, many villages of India, and I have talked to many village people who never, ever in their life even heard the word Jesus. They never heard the word Jesus. They had no idea about anything about Jesus Christ. Totally untouched with the gospel. There are millions of people like this in India today who have no knowledge of the gospel at all. And this is very sad when you stop to realize that missions have been working in India for probably now altogether 400 or 500 years since the missionary program started in this country. After all of these years and missionaries coming and the Indian pastors and evangelists, still today much of India has not heard anything about the gospel. If you, if you talk to some of these village people and you say, Jesus died on the cross, they never heard the word cross before. They don't even know what a cross is. Many villages never heard the word cross. If you say, Jesus died to save you from your sin, they don't know what sin is. Their idea of sin is one thing. Our idea of sin is another thing. We think that if you tell a lie, you have committed a sin. But many of the village people think if you tell a lie and you're not caught, you're a very clever man. <laughs> we think that if you steal, that is a sin. Many of those village people, they don't think like that. They think if you get a chance to steal, you should steal something. Their whole concept of life is different. And here we are told by Jesus to take the gospel to every creature. That is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But in India, we have not begun to fulfill the Great Commission. India is still, to a great degree, untouched with the gospel. Now the question is, how are we going to do a better job? What must we do to fulfill the Great Commission, to reach India's millions? What must we do? Too many of the churches that we have established they become busy in their own affair. They have their positions in the church and sometimes they get into arguments and they quarrel with each other in the church and sometimes the churches are filled with all kinds of problems. And while all of this is going on in the church, outside of the church people remain untouched with the gospel. This is sad and it should not be. How can this change? How can this change? So I was thinking a great deal about this today. And as I thought about the challenge of India's millions, I thought about a little man, a little man that came to India from South Africa, though he was an Indian himself, but he had studied in England, became a lawyer, and then he went to South Africa, and later he came to India. 
And he came to India with a vision and a desire to bring freedom to the people of India. And you all know that I am talking about Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was shot just about one year before I came to India. I came to India with my family. No, I came to not with my family, with my father and mother and sister. I came to India in March of 1949. This was soon after independence came to India. Mahatma Gandhi was shot, I believe, in January of 1948. So when I came to India, I heard about Gandhi constantly. I heard so many people talking about Mahatma Gandhi. And I met people, a few people, who knew him personally. I read books about Mahatma Gandhi. I, I knew so much about Gandhi that I almost felt like I knew him personally. But I did not know him personally. I only knew a lot about him. And I wished that I could have seen him. I wished I could have at least had the chance to see Mahatma Gandhi. Because he was such an unusual person. He was never an official in the government of India. He never held a position in the government of India. And yet, he was the most influential man in this nation. As it is said, he held in the palms of his hand 365 million Indian people. He had more influence in India than any, any other person. No president or no politicians had as much influence and power in India as Mahatma Gandhi. And he brought independence to this country. But what was the weapon, what was the weapon that Mahatma Gandhi used to bring freedom to the people of India? And in that connection, we're going to take a look now at what I've written here on the board, spiritual warfare in India. And then here it says, our weapons. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. Let's open our Bibles now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. Before we read, before we read this verse in Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse four, <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi had a burden and a desire to bring freedom to the people of India. That was his vision. That was his desire. That was the longing of his life. That was the goal of his life. <clears throat> he did not allow other things to sidetrack him, but he kept focused on this need. India must have freedom. The same thing happened, of course, when he was in South Africa. In South Africa, the Indian people were not treated as equals to the white people in South Africa. If there was an Indian and a white man walking on the sidewalk, when the white man came, the Indian would have to get off the sidewalk. He could not walk on the same sidewalk with the white man. In the trains, the first class trains of South Africa, only the white man could ride in the first class train. The Indian was not allowed. And the Indians were mistreated terribly in South Africa. So when God, Mahatma Gandhi saw this, and that's before he became Mahatma, then he was Gandhiji. When Gandhiji saw this, it made him so unhappy 
<coughs> that he got into the first class train in South Africa, knowing that Indians were not supposed to be there. He was an attorney, he was dressed as an attorney, and he got inside the first class train with his small case and sat down there. And then the police came. The police came and they said, what are you doing in here? This is only for the white man. You have no permission to sit in this first class compartment. And he said, here is my ticket. I purchased my ticket. I've already paid for my ticket. Why should I not sit here? They said, you cannot sit here because you are an Indian. And he would not leave. So they threw his suitcase out and they forced him to leave the compartment. Well, that was just the beginning. But there was a desire and a burden in Gandhi's heart to bring freedom in South Africa for the Indian people. And he did that. But to do that, he had to use a special weapon. And then when he came to India, it was the same thing. The British had ruled India for 300 years. For 300 years, the British ruled <coughs> India. And now he comes to South Africa, and I mean to India, and he wants to bring freedom to 364 million people. What weapon would he use to bring freedom to millions of people in India? Usually when governments think of weapons for warfare, they think of guns, they think of ammunition, they think of bombs, they think of airplanes, they think of all of the artillery. This is what countries think about when they think about weapons. But Mahatma Gandhi knew there is another weapon that can be used. And that is a weapon that nobody else understood. He had an understanding of a weapon that others could not understand. And where did Mahatma Gandhi get that understanding of a weapon? He got it from the Bible and from the life of Christ. Because Jesus had taught in the Sermon on the Mount Jesus had said, if you are smitten on one cheek, turn the other. Don't fight back. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. This is what Jesus taught. If you're hit on one side, don't fight. Turn the cheek. Let them hit you again. All of this concept of the new weapon that Mahatma Gandhi had, he got this from the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now let us consider what weapon we should use when we think about the spiritual warfare we have in India where Satan is trying to capture the lives of millions of Indian people. We are in a spiritual warfare. We have got to find a way to overcome the power of Satan to bring freedom, that people may be set free from the bondage of Satan. Now in India, Mahatma Gandhi said, people need to be set free from the British. But where we are concerned, we know that people need to be set free from the bondage of Satan. Satan is the god of this world. He's trying to capture the lives of people. How can they be set free? So we need to consider our weapon here. And we're reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have a weapon to use for spiritual warfare, and that is a spiritual weapon, 
and it <coughs> will not be a part of our life until we have become totally <coughs> committed and submitted to Jesus Christ. We will not make that commitment to him and use that weapon as it should be used unless we have a burden for souls. How many of you know they can understand the Hindi language? If you understand some of the Hindi language, raise your hand. There's a bhajan, a bhajan that I used to say often and we loved it in our church. And I was uh, thinking about that budget today. Prabhu Kadarshan. If you know that, let's sing. Let's sing it then. I want us to sing that because that's a beautiful budget and it is about what we are talking about now. Prabhu Kadarshan, Prabhu Kadarshan, Pake Pai, Laka Jaseva Me. Prabhu Kadarshan, Prabhu Kadarshan, Pake Pai, Laka Jaseva Me. Bharat Varsha Pulave Tuchako. It's this kind of a vision, have a vision of Christ, and then it says thousands of souls are dying in the sea of sin, and are we willing to give our life to rescue the perishing? That's what this song is all about. Do we really have a vision of the need of India? Now you are young people, you are here in Bible school. Why have you come to Bible school? Why are you here? Are you here just to waste your time? Are you here just to learn more about the Bible? What about your future? What do you plan to do? When you finish Bible school, what are you going to do then? Go get a job somewhere? Or do you have a vision or what Christ can do through your life. God wants to use you, but you have got to make that commitment to Christ. Have a burden in your own heart. If you don't have a burden for souls, you don't need to be here. The real reason you're here should be because you have a desire to reach the lost. And God will help you to prepare for that task before you. And the weapons you have are spiritual weapons. God has given you spiritual weapons to make it possible for you to do what he wants you to do. So I'm praying that God will raise up people like you and many others in India that have a real genuine burden for souls. There is no way we are going to reach India's millions unless we change some of our thinking. And I pray that there will be a real spiritual renewal and revival in our hearts. A man like Brother Peter Singh here, he has worked for many years already. In India, he knows the challenge. He understands the need. And we need people who can work in the villages, we need people who work, can work in the cities. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the man who is good in the city can't work so well among the village people. 
village people are very different often from the city people. And often the people who are good in the villages don't work very well in the city. We need both types of people. And I pray that God will raise up young people just like you to help us reach the millions of India with his wonderful gospel. And the weapons that God has given us are spiritual weapons. Mahatma Gandhi had a weapon that others didn't understand. And the British didn't know what to do when Mahatma Gandhi told the people, don't fight back. When you're arrested, if they put you in jail, go to jail, but don't resist. It was a peaceful type of warfare that Mahatma Gandhi tried to teach people. But sometimes that wasn't <coughs> easy because people would become angry and they would not listen to Mahatma Gandhi, so he had to go on a fast. And he would fast until people stopped fighting and became peaceful again. And we have the same problem with, within us. Sometimes it's hard for us to walk in the spirit, to live as we should live and work as we should work. But if we'll do what God wants us to do, the future is very, very bright. Well, I wanted to share that with you. And um, we're going to have our exam. We'll take time.